for allowing us to have these few minutes where we can draw together as Christians and, and focus on your, your word in, in a more uh, specific way, looking at here the, the text of the book of Genesis. We thank you for Moses and the things that he did and the things that he accomplished. And Father, you called him into your service and, and he did that, did that work in, in such an effective way. And he wrote this for us, for us to read many, many years later. Father, we pray that we'll understand it in the right way and, and take whatever lessons are found in, in the text and, and, and help us, Father, to understand you better, uh, to conceive of you more in our minds, and, and, and Father, to understand your will and the progression um, that is developing throughout this book of, of redemption that ultimately finds its fulfillment in, in Christ and in the church. Father, we thank you, and here we've gathered together as the church. We're thankful for everyone who's here, for the young children, the, the small ones. Father, for those who are teenagers and, and those, um, Father, in their 20s and their college and young professionals. And Father, we thank you for those who are middle-aged and older. And Father, we thank you for everyone who's here, for all of our families, for all of our individuals. We ask you to, to be with us and help us to draw together as a church family as you want us to. Help us to center all of our fellowship together, all of our work together, and all of our appreciation for each other um, with your word at, at the center of that. Father, we thank you that you have called us by your grace uh, into this fellowship and into our fellowship with you. We thank you for your son Jesus who came to die for us and three days later was raised from the dead. Father, we thank you that uh, he is now reigning over, over his kingdom and we're thankful that we can be a part of that kingdom today. Father, there are so many around us um, who are lost, who are lost in sin and um, we, we work with them and we live with some of them in our homes and in our families. Father, we, we are in these neighborhoods and we're surrounded by unbelievers and those who are lost. Help us, use us as your instruments um, to call men and women to life in Jesus Christ. Um, help us to understand that this is the task that you've given to us. Help us to be successful at it. Help us when we see opportunities to, to seize them and, and, uh, and to make the most of them. And Father, work through us to save others. That power, we realize, is not in ourselves. It's, it's not in our intelligence or in our tactfulness or in our, in our wisdom. Um, but we pray that you would, you would draw us as you draw us to yourself and make us after the image of Christ, that we will be uh, fit instruments for your work in, in saving others. Father, we are humbled by this task that you have given to us, but we pray that we will pray often and we will think often uh, of this great service that you've called us into. We pray, Father, that you would be in, with our world. We live in such a troubled world and and individually we pray for different ones who are dealing with with uh, difficulties in their lives and, and most of all those difficulties that have been um, uh, caused by sin. Uh, Father, we live in a world of sin and it's just all around us. We pray that, that you would be with, with not only us, but with others. Father, that when they hear the gospel and when they hear your word, that they will be changed by it and they will think better thoughts and and, and be drawn closer and closer to you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being long-suffering towards us. Thank you for your mercy and for your love, which ultimately um, saves us. Father, we pray that you would bless those who are sick and those who couldn't be with us. Father, we are mindful of, uh, of Steve's son, Ryan, and we pray for his recovery we pray for his healing and be with all of Steve and Pam's uh, family at this time. Uh, Father, others, other family members that we know of who have had surgeries recently and, 
and uh, who some of them are homesick, some of them are in the hospital, and we pray for their healing and for their comfort and, and strength. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study this morning. We pray that you would bless the other classes as well, and we're thankful for all of our teachers who have thought and who have studied and who have prepared these presentations to students, and we pray that we'll all be better because we've come together this morning to study your word. Be with us in a few minutes as we worship you, and we pray that you'll be pleased by the songs that we sing and the message and and the prayers that we pray and everything that we do as we've come together to praise your your great and and holy name because you're so worthy. Be with us now as we as we study. We pray these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles, please, to um, um, Genesis chapter 8. Um, Genesis chapter 8. So good to see um, you here today. And um, it's, it's just great when Christians come together like we have today. Um, we're in Genesis chapter 8, and uh, we're, we're really going to pick up with about verse uh, 15. Um, verse 13 and 14, just to, we're not going to review, but I just want to just read this because this is the setup for where we have come um, so far. Um, Noah and the animals and Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, they've all been saved. They've been saved by God's means uh, in the ark, um, the great flood that came upon the world. Um, God brought that flood upon the world. Uh, he condemned the world um, and uh, many, many souls perished and among the animals as well, and the earth itself was changed and ruptured um, by, what, uh, by what occurred. And um, just imagine being on that ark with those animals making their animal sounds and, and you and your family and wondering what's going to happen the next day and the next day after that. And um, if you're able to peer out of the ark in any way, you see the flood waters, maybe the clouds are darkened and we, we don't know the scene, but it was a catastrophic scene and, and nothing like Noah and his family had ever seen before. Maybe they had seen bodies of water before, but, but nothing, nothing uh, could match uh, what had occurred and, and the devastation that came as a result of it. So in verses 13 and 14, we read that it came to pass in the 601st year in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and and looked and indeed the surface of the ground was dry, okay? So the waters had diminished, the waters had abated and so they looked upon the earth and, and it was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth, um, was dried. And so even when he saw um, that the surface of the ground was dry in verse 13, um, they still didn't come out of the ark immediately. Okay. Uh, And they're not going to do that until now we come to verse 15. You know, Noah and his family and the animals, they went into the ark. It took them about seven days to, to get everything gathered together and everybody go into the ark and the ark was closed up and and it began to rain, and the waters became, uh, uh, came on the earth. And, and they came into the ark at the behest of God, at the invitation of God. God said, come, come into the ark. Noah had built the ark, but it was God's ark. It belonged to him. It was his means of salvation for Noah. And uh, now God is going to speak to them again. And what this reminds us is of what we've been reminded of throughout this time that we're spending with Noah and his family in the ark. And that is that everything that God commanded him to do, he did it. He did it. And that is, that is a point not to be uh, diminished in any way, not to be lost. They did everything that God commanded him to do. And I think Noah is very sensitive to this. He, he acts only when God tells him to act. Uh, so they're shut up in this ark. Seemingly, you, you might be able to go out of the ark because the ground is dry, but they still wait um, at least another month, almost another two months before they leave the ark. So in verses 15, um, really verses 15 through 19, uh, God spoke to Noah saying, 
Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh <clears throat> that is with you. And birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, verse 18, just like God told him to do. Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. You'll notice here throughout this whole account that there's this constant repetition of who is on board the ark and who goes out of the ark, okay? I mean, it said, you know, all these animals, and, and I would have been content to, to say all of the animals and all the insects, you know, they all went on the ark and they all came out of the ark. But, I mean, such detail uh, about, and, and he doesn't give us the detail, but he, uh, I mean, details about every single animal, like elephants and giraffes and, 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 and all of that, but, but every living thing uh, of all flesh that is with you and so that covers everything. It really covers everything. And when I think of creeping thing, I think of insects, okay? Uh, but maybe not necessarily. It could be lizards and, and, and that kind of thing as well. And because they creep and spiders and, and uh, but he says birds and cattle, birds and cattle, they, they all go out of the ark. And the point is uh, the reason why they were saved is so that they might be fruitful and, and, and they might multiply on the earth. And Noah too. Okay, Noah too, and his wife and his sons and, and their wives, that they too might, might uh, multiply. So uh, basically, very similar, verses 15 through 19 is very similar to God's original design for humanity. Okay, when he created Adam and Eve, and he created the man and the woman, he says, um, um, created in my image, and you're going to have dominion upon the earth, and that's going to be repeated again here as well, and I want you to be fruitful. And, and multiply. So humanity is charged by God with repopulating the earth. And the reason they need to do that is because everyone is dead now. Everyone is perished. So when we pick up in verse 20, and this will actually take us into verse, into chapter 19, because chapter, I mean, chapter 9, because this is a continuation of, of what we're finding here in, in chapter, uh, chapter 8. So, and, and what we're going to find here is something that we found earlier, though it's not stated in the same way, that men, the, these men who are coming out of the ark, they're going to call on the name of the Lord again, okay? They're going to call. Remember, remember in Seth's line, okay, you have men calling on the name of the Lord, and you're going to have that being done again here in God establishing his covenant with them. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. I'm going to keep on reading here into chapter 9, okay? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease, okay? Going into chapter 9 here. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now let's just stop right there, if we can, and, and just go back and make a couple of comments, not too many, uh, regarding verse 20 and going into, into chapter 9. So Noah builds this ark. That's the first thing he does, okay? At least that's the first thing it's stated um, that, that he does. Uh, the animals are released. They go about their business, uh, populating, repopulating, multiplying on the earth. And uh, the first thing it tells us in verse 20 that Noah does is he builds um, an ark. Uh, why did he do that? Uh, maybe the Lord is, um, he, he commands him to do that. He commands him to do it this way. It could be also that the Lord is reminding Noah of the worship that had been given to the Lord previously. 
um, uh, Cain and Abel had worshipped the Lord. We're assuming that Adam had worshipped the Lord as well. And we read that in Seth's line, at least, that men were calling on the name of the Lord. And so this worship, this idea of worship, this is not the first thing, first time that this has ever occurred. But it, how appropriate it is for Noah to think to do this or for God to command him to do this and to begin setting this precedent of worshiping God and thinking about God and praising God and giving thanks to him. Um, no doubt a part of this was giving thanks to God for his deliverance, for his deliverance um, from the flood. So they built this altar to the Lord and notice the offerings that they made, um, every clean animal and of uh, every clean bird. Now, we, we've noticed before that when they put animals on the ark, when God called the animals and they came forward and they were put on the ark, you remember that we studied in the last chapter that um, the, there were more of the clean animals, it seems, than there were of the unclean animals. And it's interesting that Moses doesn't give us a lot of information about what is a clean animal and what is a, an unclean animal. What's the difference between those two? He probably doesn't need to do that at this time because later on, under the law of Moses, there are going to be specifications given for the difference between the two animals. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Recall, I have it in my notes, I just didn't want to look it up, but recall, I believe it's Leviticus chapter 25, if I, if I, I may be mistaken about that, but it's in the book of Leviticus, as you said there, Bill. Yeah, okay, I just read that recently as well, so I'm kind of thinking, oh, I don't remember, uh, Leviticus chapter, I think it's chapter 25, but I may be wrong about that, and you can all co correct that if, if you want, but what a wise course this is. Truly a wise course, whether the Lord directed him to do it or, or, or Noah already being a worshiper of God before the flood. Um, he walked with God. He was involved in God. He was serving God. He was perfect in his generation. Certainly he had been a worshiper of God. And now the, a wise course here uh, to offer um, uh, offerings uh, to God, building an altar and offering um, these animals on the altar. And of course, because there are more clean animals than, than unclean, then there, there, is enough anim there are enough animals to offer here. What about his family? Well, it doesn't say anything about the family. It says Noah did this, but in, in this patriarchal time, um, the heads of the family acted in behalf of, of, uh, of the family. And uh, no doubt, uh, no question that all of the other uh, individuals in Noah's family, they uh, were worshiping along with him as well. What I find especially interesting, and I'll, I'll go on to verse 21. Go ahead, Roger, please. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You could have offered one or you could have offered more and still have animals uh, clean of the clean animals, yeah, available, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, the, the, the unclean animals exist for a reason and uh, they were spared and they were saved on the ark. So they exist, yeah, they exist for a reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, there was a continual resource here available to them, obviously, and, and of the clean animals. And so, you know, God made that provision, and, and Noah complied with, with everything God wanted him to do. Um, verse 21 is, is interesting um, because it, um, it uh, gives us a reaction from God regarding the uh, altar that Noah built and the offerings that, that were made. Um, and um, the, the idea here, and, and the whole sentence, but the, but the word smelled itself within the, the, the whole sentence of the context of this is showing that the Lord, his favor, he, he is favoring this and he is pleased with Noah and pleased with his family at, at what Noah was doing here. Um, so God's disposition, and this, this is very interesting to make this contrast here, God's disposition here with Noah and the family and what had occurred is strikingly different than God's disposition before the flood. Compare what God is doing here in his reaction, his disposition, with his disposition in chapter 6, where God is sorry that he had made man where God is going to bring this judgment flood. It wasn't just a flood, it was a judgment that God was bringing upon the world. God is punishing sin and his justice is at work. And um, he's going to destroy um, men and women who have committed sin and, and he brings this judgment upon them. But, but now you're not, you're not hearing that. You're not hearing that tone anymore. Um, he's pleased, obviously pleased with Noah and his response and his obedience. Noah is continuing to walk with God. Okay, clearly he's continuing uh, with that. God, the, the, the point of verse 21 is that God is appeased. God is appeased. It reminds me of that important word that we find in Romans chapter 3 and elsewhere in Scripture, but it's not found often. But the concept is there of propitiation, okay? God's wrath is appeased, and God's wrath has been appeased here, okay? Uh, primarily, primarily, this is, this is interesting, primarily God's wrath is appeased by what God himself has done, okay? God appeases himself, really, okay? He brings his judgment upon the earth and, and upon men, upon sinners, and then Noah responds to all of this in obedience and now in worship to God, Noah and his family, and God looks upon all that he has done and what Noah has done in response to all of that. God is pleased, God is pleased. And, and you better believe that God is pleased with you and me as well. When we fall in line, if we conform to what God has done, God has set up appeasement through the death of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if we conform to this, this scheme of redemption, if we conform to that, God is appeased. God is pleased with our, with our behavior and Please with himself. Please with himself. Go ahead, Susan. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I believe it's, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the book of Philippians that this language is used. But I think in Romans chapter 15, if I'm not mistaken as well, Romans 15, where Paul is talking about the fact, his work among the Gentiles and preaching the gospel and how he is, he is offering them to God. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a little bit odd, a little bit strange language to us about the sweet smelling aroma and all that. We, we know what sweet aromas smell like and that it's pleasing to us. Um, uh, but when we please God and, and we're serving him through Christ, 
It's like a sweet aroma that goes up to the nostrils of God and uh, he's pleased. Pull it right mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, like incense. Very good. Very good comparison. Yeah, Bill. Uh huh. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that, that's such a, you're raising a couple of points and I won't elaborate too much on that, but when we worship God, we are, Worship is essentially communication with God. And we think of, well, when we're singing praises to Him, and we think of God watching, and we think of God hearing the praises. Um, but here, it's, it's, it, there is an aroma that comes up out of the, the, out of the burnt sacrifice and, and all of that. Here, when we're together, we're not burning anything, so there's not like an aroma or anything like that. It's not like a barbecue, okay? It's not like that. And that smells so good, doesn't it? It smells so good to us. But we can put it in that kind of terminology. There's nothing wrong with doing that. When we're worshiping here, it's like a sweet aroma that we're offering to, to the Lord. And the Lord is pleased. That's the whole point. We're communicating to God that we love Him. And, and, and we're giving Him thanks and praise. And yeah. Very, very, very good comments. You've kind of taken that a little bit further than, than I was thinking about it. And, but, I, but I think it's all true. I, I do. I think all of this is, is true. Then the Lord said in his heart, you see, he smelled that aroma and he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Now, the Lord had already decided that he was going to do this. He'd already given uh, Moses or, or Noah uh, details about this that, you know, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. I'm going to destroy the, the earth and everything, but I'm going to establish my covenant with you, okay? Uh, but the Lord, he, he elaborates on what he is doing and what the future is going to be like. I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have, have done. So the lifting... Uh, um, What's interesting here is a couple of interesting things here. He says, I will never curse the ground for man's sake. Now remember in Genesis chapter three, remember how the ground is cursed? Okay, remember that? Now that's not what is being mentioned here as far as I, as far as I can ascertain. He's not lifting that curse, okay? that life is going to have challenges and life is going to have difficulties, okay? What he's saying is, is, is just sticking to the language here, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore, okay? Like I did in the flood, okay? I'm not going to, there's not going to be a repetition of that. But add to that, the Lord says he's not going to do it but the Lord has to still be pained, okay, because of, of man's heart. He says, I will not do this, I will not curse the ground for man's sake, although, although, and I take that to mean, although he deserves it, okay, although he deserves it, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Where have we heard that language before? In Genesis chapter 6, okay, just a few chapters ago. Why is, he, why is he bringing the flood upon the earth? Because every imagination of the hearts of men is only evil in that continually. My question for you to just consider, and, and I don't know if we need to talk about this or not, but my question is, why is the Lord not going to keep on doing this? Why is the Lord not going to continue to purge the earth like this? I mean, every so often, every hundred years or every uh, a thousand years, maybe the earth needs to be purged again. Okay, why? Because 
and, and this is the interesting part of this is, even after all of this flood, even after all of this judgment and, and building the ark and all of that, what has changed? What has changed from our perspective? Who we are? Because every imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Mm. Bill. Was the earth cleansed by the water and everything? Yeah, I mean, to, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess I guess you can you can you know, cleansed, cleansed. But I just think of I at least in my terminology, I think of he just he destroyed. It was judged and um, cleansed. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, certainly, a starting over. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The comparison is made throughout Scripture, isn't it, that of the judgment of the flood and the, the final judgment that's coming, to be sure. God, God was bringing this flood. The, the imagination of man's heart is evil and that continually. Okay? That doesn't mean we have this irreversible sentence on us that we have to, you know, we're wallowing in evil and we can't do anything about it. No, um, God created a mechanism in Noah's day, the ark, and man needed to conform to that and contribute to that and, and all of that. And so you have the ark, which saved man, okay? Is, Noah's not perfect and his sons are not perfect and we're gonna see that, that they're not perfect either, okay? Guess what? Um, God is going to bring judgment upon the earth again. <laughs> Seemingly, it's not going to be by water, right? It's, it's, but, but he's going to bring judgment. Do we have a mechanism for salvation? Yes. Yes, we do. It's, it's, just, it's amazing to me, and, and this ought to settle on our hearts a little bit, and that is that God saves us even in our imperfection. Um... Even when we are sinners, God, God saves us, okay? That's, Jesus came while we were in sin, right? And created a mechanism through him and through his blood uh, for us to be saved. Yeah, do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is exactly right. And parents need to realize, too, that you're going to have children, and guess what? They're going to grow up and be sinners. Our children are going to sin. They are going to sin. We might just, just accept that they're going to sin. And it's your job as a parent, a loving parent, to help them through Christ, through God's patience, to manage through that and come out on the other side better. You know? Um, so go ahead, Dave. Right. 
Mm. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, very, very well said. And repeating, really, you're just repeating what Peter says in First Peter chapter 3. Very good. Susan? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. We should be blameless, but we're not going to be sinless. That's right. Yes, the, the mechanism that we have through Christ is that, um, is that he takes away this. He takes this away. Um, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, the Lord will take that away and he will cleanse you and you can improve. And you may not do that perfectly, but, but you, that's part of the mechanism too, is we can keep coming back for, for the cleansing and keep coming back to, to restoration uh, with God. So, yeah, th- this is, this is a, uh, in verse 21, it's kind of disappointing in some ways when you read that, that, oh, well, what, then what's really changed? What's really changed, you know? Um, well, as far as we're concerned, in need of God, in need of Him in our lives and His salvation, that, that hasn't changed, okay? That hasn't changed, but... Um, but men and women, we see again and again in these pictures throughout Scripture, they can come to God and they can be saved. Okay, so that's, that's, that's great. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So uh, the Lord brought this flood upon the world. His anger, His justice, His justice um, really to show and kind of echoing what Dave said there and what all of you have said, to show the whole world um, so that some will be saved. Some will be saved and they um, can be saved when the next judgment comes, okay? It's another interesting thing here that Moses doesn't give us a lot of details about. Okay, well, will there be another judgment in the future? Well, there, there will be, there will be. And we know this from the rest of the scriptures. Anyway, the, the next verse, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. God's wrath is satisfied here. In this instance, God's wrath is satisfied. Um, his justice is satisfied. Satisfied by sacrifice, by man's attitude of humility and reverence toward God, all on display by Noah and by his uh, children. And the flood itself allowed a demonstration of God's wrath towards sin. What do we learn about the flood, about God's attitude towards sin? That he doesn't, he's not gonna tolerate it. He'll be patient, but don't confuse patience with toler- tolerance, okay? God will not tolerate sin. There will be an accounting for sin, okay? But he's patient with it sometimes. <laughs> hey, don't, don't take that patience too much to the bank because God has shown impatience also um, with human beings while he has shown patience as well. Anyway, the flood is a definite precursor to the final judgment. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter uh, 24. Um, Peter talked about it as well. And uh, throughout the New Testament, we find this going back, remember the flood, remember what happened. While the earth remains, qualifies what he just said in verse 21, never again, never again, while the earth remains. Guess what? When the judgment comes, the earth is not going to remain anymore. Okay? Second Peter chapter 3, the earth is not going to remain God preserves the earth. He preserves its ecology, okay, until the final judgment, 2 Peter chapter 3. I don't know what this says to us about ecology. You know, a lot of times people want to go to the Bible and they want to kind of find their, you know, 
What does it say to us about kind of the fad thing going on today is taking care of the, the environment and where the ecology has become a religion to people. Um, well, we, we don't want to make it a religion. We want God to be the, the centerpiece of, of our faith and our religion. But if, are, are we to understand that he's saying here that we're not going to be able to destroy these things? There's always going to be a time of harvest. There's always going to be seed time. There's always going to be summer and winter. Okay? Those things are always going to be. So don't go crazy thinking that we are going to destroy uh, the planet. Okay? Now, we can, we can destroy a lot of things. And we can destroy a lot of the planet. Okay? But we're not going to destroy the planet. Okay? Um, it might might be a little bit more difficult to do that than, than we might realize, but day and night will not cease. Okay? They're going to continue on. So um, that, that's a great promise. Great promise. All right. Our time is up. We'll, we'll quit there instead of going into chapter 9 at this point. And chapter 9, as I said a moment ago, will be a continuation of, of chapter 8, and it's not going to take us too long to get through chapter 9. Chapter 10 won't take us very long at all. Um, but there are a couple of details that we're going to have to point out there in chapter 10. Thank you all very much for being a part of our uh, Bible class this morning, and we'll get ready for a time of worship.